Praise the Lord. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thank you, online students, for uh, joining class this morning. Uh, welcome to our uh, e-learning students who will be listening to this lecture later on. And also welcome to our um, in-person students. Thank you all for joining class. Is anyone sitting in the second row? No? Then Nisi and the other person at the back can come in front. Come. Come up in front, please. What is your name? Yeah, what is your name? Yes. Yes. Gautam, can you come here, Gautam, please? Yeah, thank you. Come, Nisi and the, uh, uh, sorry, I don't know your name. Yeah, please come up in front. Gautam, you can come up here. Yes. Okay, um, good morning, Saubhagya and Simangaliso. I hope I pronounced your name right. Um, thank you all for joining class. We'll continue studying the publication, Fulfilling God's Purpose for Your Life. Uh, we just have two more chapters to go through. We were, uh, we looked at chapter four. We did not complete that yesterday, but uh, we'll continue on from there. Uh, before that, uh, can we just pause for a word of prayer? So can one of the ladies quickly take up the mics, please? Where's the mic? Uh, can you please pass it on to the ladies? And can one of you quickly pray, please? Anyone? Nobody wants to pray? Thank you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for this day, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for everything that you are doing for us, Lord. Lord, we, this morning we come before you, Lord. You talk to us, Lord. You speak to us, each one of us, Lord. Lord, I ask wisdom, knowledge, understanding, Lord. You be here with your presence, Lord. Lord, as we are learning, Lord, uh, uh, let we apply everything to our lives, Lord. To you, Father, I give all the honor, all the praise, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So we'll uh, continue looking at chapter 4. We were basically studying about how to position ourselves to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. So we looked at we need to position ourselves to receive, to fulfill God's purpose. We need to position ourselves to receive God's provision protection, his promotion, right? And also we need to position ourselves in the current move of God, what God is doing uh, to position ourselves so that we can know, understand, receive, and move with God, what God is telling us to do. And we looked at a couple of examples about the brazen serpent, about Moses and John's uh, disciples, okay? Um, so towards the end of the chapter, we are on page number 42 in the publication. Um, there are some things that we need to keep in mind as we position ourselves, okay? The first thing we need to keep in mind is be willing to let go. Don't hold on to your past and don't hold on to your present, okay? Uh, uh, if you are holding on to your past, if you're holding on to your present, you will not be able to step into the future. Sometimes we are so comfortable living in the present, we are so comfortable with what has happened in the past that we don't want to step into something that is unknown, something that is new, right? Because when something is new and unknown, it's very unfamiliar, it's a lot of hard work, it's again doing things from scratch and we don't like it. But if we want to step into what God has for us in the future, we have to be willing to let go of the past. That means the past mistakes, uh, you know, failures, things that have happened in the past. Just let go because, you know, when it weighs down heavily on you, you're not able to run ahead, right? Just let go of everything. Let go of what people have done in the past, the hurts, the disappointments, the frustrations, the failures. And um, even in the present, if things are not going well, just be willing to let go and step into your um, future. There are only two things that you should never let go and that you need to hold on to tightly. What are those two things? What are two things in life that you need to hold on to tightly and not let go? What is the first two things? Your salvation, okay, your relationship with God. Yes. What is the second thing? 
your spouse, your marriage, your family. Okay, your spouse, your children, your family is something that you never let go for anybody or anything else. Okay, your spouse or your, you know, your children might not be perfect. Doesn't mean that someone else is perfect and you go away with them. No, you don't uh, let go of these two things. Relationship with God, your family, your marriage. That is, you hold on to your spouse and to your uh, children. Okay, But there are so many other things that we hold on to so tightly that we're unable to receive what God has in store for you. God wants to give. But if you're all also holding on to things, then he cannot give you. If your hand is empty, that's when he can give you. So let go of the past. The second one is be willing to step out into the unknown, right? When we, um, the future is something that is unknown to us, okay? It's something that is, um, we have seen everything, everything is not planned. Um, it's uh, unknown and sometimes it can be well, a lot of difficulty, a lot of concerns, a lot of worry. But if you want to take that step into the future, you know, you need to just know that, you know, there is a God who's backing you. If he's saying leave and go, leave and go. If he's saying take this on, take it on. If he's saying don't do that, don't do that, right? Step into this uh, assignment, you step into it. You don't see things clearly. Everything is not perfect, but God will unfold things. He will work things. It's not that when God tells you to step into a relationship, step into an assignment, step into a new job, go to a new place, everything is going to be perfect. No, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of, uh, you know, uh, uh, things that you'll have to do, give up. Uh, it, a lot of effort that you have to put in. But it's worth taking that effort because God is with you. You have the king of heaven backing you up, the king of the kingdom backing you up. And there's nothing that can stop you. Amen? Okay, we, saw, we see that in the life of Abraham, right? Did God tell him which place he want, has to go? No. But he just stepped out and God just guided him and led him to the place of his inheritance. Not only to his inheritance, but his children's children, the generations to come. The third thing is be careful how you enter and leave. Okay. Now, how you leave determines how you enter. Now, for example, God is telling you, uh, leave this job and get into a new job. Or leave Bangalore city and go to this city. Or leave your city and go to another place uh, for a job or for a ministry assignment. And you're excited because, you know, you got a breakthrough. God is taking you somewhere else. And then when you're leaving, you're saying, okay, this is my good opportunity because I'm not coming back. The place that I've been working, the people that I've been working with have been very nasty with me, have not been good to me. So it's a good time to tell them what I think about them. So anyway, I'm not going, I'm going to leave I'm going to leave the city. I'm going to leave this job. It's a good time for me to give my boss a good time to give my colleagues who have troubled me, um, you know, peace of my mind or what I think about them. Now, that itself is not a right attitude. That itself is not a godly attitude. And you need to be very careful because you can give it to them good. Can, you know, tell them everything you want to say, pour out your heart get angry, use words, you know, and all of those things give a good piece of your mind. But remember, when you leave with that anger, that bitterness, that hatred, that, um, that sense of, um, you know, um, uh, uh, sense of uh, rudeness or whatever it is, insensitivity or whatever it is, you know, you're entering into the next place with that same emotions. Okay, you've left this place, but you're entering the next place with the same emotions of anger, bitterness, you know, hatred, enmity, whatever it is in your heart. You know, you're entering the next place and it's not going to help you because you're carrying on the same thing. And what if God brings you back to, the, to Bangalore City? Maybe you've gone to Hyderabad, Chennai, you know, wherever, and God brings you back to Bangalore. You have to meet the same people. Maybe you, you know, rub shoulders with them. Who knows, you know, you, the, the same boss lands up being another boss or giving you, you know, feedback of your work. So you need to be very careful, okay? So uh, if you've burnt bridges with people, it can be difficult, okay? Um, because, you know, um, it's going to uh, 
uh, cause a lot of problems for you, cause a lot of unwanted emotions and feelings which are not godly, which you're going to carry back in the next place. And it also can have an effect. You never know. People know each other. They can recommend. They can talk about you. They can say things. So it's wise to be careful how you enter and how you leave. Leave with love. Leave with forgiveness. Leave with a good attitude so that you can enter with a good attitude and with the right spirit, okay? The fourth one is uh, even as oh, things to keep in mind as we position ourselves is to be open to change. There are new things coming up. God is bringing new things in your life. You cannot receive the new things if you are not open to change, okay? Yes, things will be different. Things will not be the same as the previous place, the previous workplace, the previous relationships that you've had. Things can be different, but you'll have to accustom yourself. You need to get used to used to those things, but it's worth it. It will teach you. It will mature you into being more Christ-like and build your character. The fifth one is prepare for the move as much as possible. Now, if you're praying and asking God, God, what is the next season of my life? God will reveal to you. He will show you so that you can prepare. Get yourself prepared for the next change in your life, whether it's your job, whether it's your studies, whether, whether it's marriage, whether it is, you know, um, having children, whatever, parenting, you know, or new friendships, uh, new business doors that God is going to open for you. Prepare for the change. The sixth one is God will at times use the actions of others to position you, okay? So there are some people who can be well-meaning, can help you. There can be some people who can be detrimental to you, who can be like a, a thorn in your flesh, so to say, you know. Uh, but, you know, God can use their actions to even uh, mature your character to position you. For example, Joseph, right? Joseph, you know what his brothers did, right? Sold him as a slave. And he worked hard for, for, for Potiphar. And it was for no mistake of his, he was thrown into prison, right? But we see from prison, where did God take him to be the prime minister of Egypt, right? The next in position to the king. So God used all of these uh, negative, so-called negative circumstances in Joseph's life to take him to his position, to fulfill his plan and purpose for your life. So even if people come in in your life who have a negative um, a taste or leave negative feelings, you know, say, God, how are you using this person to position me? Okay. So I've learned in life, you know, when people give me feedback, I always take feedback because it has helped me to become a better person. Even if somebody who I know does not like me and say things, I always listen to them because I know that, hey, they might have something to say about me that I need to change, that I can correct. I don't overlook them. I don't say, hey, they don't like me. They're jealous of me or they hate me or they can't stand me. But they might have some wealth of knowledge or information that they can give about me as a person. So I always have taken feedback and feedback has helped me to grow and mature as a person. Okay, so God can use other people's actions to position you. Uh, the seventh one is be strategic. Don't wander in life aimlessly. Okay, uh, we must look at everything in life. God is connecting us to his plan and purpose. So you're saying, God, I'm here in Bible college. I'm studying. But how are you connecting this to the purpose of my life? What are you saying, God, in this season? I think you need to, we, each one of us need to speak and ask God. I just can't say, God, you know, I've been doing this for so many years. I've been uh, writing children's church curriculum for so many years. I've been, uh, you know, running the school outreach ministry of APC now for so many years. I've been teaching in the Bible college. Um, not just I just be comfortable and, you know, continue with this lifelong. But I need to ask God, God, what is the next season of my life? Or in this season, as a teacher, how I can improve? Or at this season as writing curriculum, how can I improve? How can I do better? Better. So I asked God in the beginning of the year and God said, you know, uh, the children have changed from the, the few, previous few years. They've changed now. So start rewriting the curriculum. So I'm rewriting all the topics that we have, have written so far for our children's church with a press 
fresh perspective, keeping in mind the children of today and all that they have gone through the pandemic and what effects it's caused in their lives and how to change things. So I'm I'm rewriting the curriculum. I'm not saying, hey, this curriculum is for lifelong. No, we need to rewrite. And I'm asking God, how can I make changes in the catalysts, our school outreach uh, uh, ministry? So in school outreach ministry, we were teaching scripture. But now in Bangalore, we have this anti-conversion bill that was passed, the law that was passed. We can't speak about God openly. So God, how can we get back to schools? We can't teach scripture. How can we go back to schools? Life skills. So start writing the life skills curriculum. So you need to really, you know, um, be strategic. Don't wander through life aimlessly, um, you know, and look at everything that God is doing, changing the history, circumstances, seasons in life, and how you need to accommodate and how you can do better to build the kingdom of God. Or even in your job place, okay, you might be a teacher for 30 years, teaching the same subject, but how can you improve as a teacher? You've been running a business or you've been a chef or you've been, uh, you know, um, uh, a pastor. How can you be better as a pastor? How can you be better as a chef? So, you know, get into new strategies, be very, very strategic. And the eighth one is none of us are perfect. We all make mistakes, but God is greater than our mistakes. Amen. He can reposition us like Jonah. Jonah, God told him to go to Nineveh. He ran away to Tarshish. Okay. And then in the middle of that big storm, he says, God, not my will. I'm ready to do where you're asking me to go. Okay. So what does God do? He doesn't say, okay, Jonah, I'm done with you. I taught you a lesson in the belly of the fish. Now you can go and do whatever you want. No, he sends him to Nineveh. God does not give up on him. God does not give up on us when we confess our sins, when we repent, when we change. He welcomes us and he causes us to, uh, you know, go ahead with the plan that he has for us. The same with Moses' life, right? Moses made a mistake and how many years did it cost him? 40 years. Yes, 40 years it cost him, right? But did God say, Moses, you wasted 40 years the people of Israel, in, uh, 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 in the Hebrew people in, in Egypt were suffering extra just because of you. He doesn't say that. He just says, go and speak to Pharaoh. He says, I will be with you. Do this. Do that. Okay. So we all make mistakes, you know, and sometimes it's our choice. But, you know, God is greater than that. Um, so sometimes, you know, we, uh, we leave a job. We go to the next job. Or we think uh, all people's church, Bible college is not suiting us. We go to another Bible college. That's totally fine. And, you know, when you go to the next job, you know, uh, in one month's time, that company closes. And you're saying, God, I thought this was your move. I was positioning myself. And what is wrong here? I thought I heard the truth that I need to position myself. And God is saying, yes, you've heard the truth that you have to position yourself. But you made the wrong choice right so in that situation what can you do you can go back to god say god i need your help and god can bring you back to on on course okay so say you can say god yes i want you to position me so that i can be at the right place doing the right things at the right time and when god and you tell god that god is uh you know takes you at your word he helps you and he helps you to fulfill his plan and purpose for your life so one thing that we learned from this lesson even if you did not remember anything you need just need to pray and say god position me in the right place the right time doing the right things okay so that i can fulfill your plan and purpose can you please take the mic can you pass the mic to him please anyone has any questions in chapter four before we move on to chapter five So you see how important it is to position yourself. Yes, Shani, uh, please go ahead. Yeah, I don't understand your, um, the, let me see, which one is it? The six that God will use actions of others to prepare you, either good or bad. I don't understand how somebody who doesn't like you, who may be jealous of you, how they can benefit from their critique or their bad talk. I, I don't understand that at all. Oh, you're saying that you don't understand the point six where it says God will at times use the actions of others to position you. That's what you're saying? Yes. In terms of people who may not like you or somebody is jealous, 
you were saying that you take their whatever they have to, I mean you still listen to them whatever they have to say but why if they don't like you and if they might just be saying something that's not true if they're jealous or whatever so why take their advice yeah so uh, what I'm saying is uh, they can have sometimes they can have a uh, you know they might be saying things that can help you not most of the times but sometimes they can show you and tell you uh, things that you're not doing right because anyway they don't like you so they're being very open about speaking that to you and saying hey this is your weakness or this is not what you're doing is right um uh, they might be saying it because they want to hurt you or put you down or because you know uh, they want to get back at you but if you really look at what they're saying at times they can help you to change they can help you to correct you uh, to see things or uh, uh, see uh, you know things in your life where you're failing i'm not saying all the time they can be right no i'm saying sometimes we can even listen to them because they can say things that can help you to change and you know make you a better person did that help uh, shani yes thank you okay okay yes uh, ma'am as you said that closer to your mouth please okay, no worries anyone else has any question when you remember you can ask your question anyone else has any questions Okay, if not, we will move on to chapter five, okay? Chapter five, um, the prize of the high calling of God, okay? Now, as you and I go about fulfilling God's purpose for our lives, we need to understand that it is it can be exciting, it can be the best, uh, it's the best uh, life to live, but there is a price to pay, okay? So tell your neighbor, be ready to pay the price. Okay, all of you tell yourself, be ready, be ready to pay the price. Yes, because it's not always going to be easy. Uh, some of us don't like these two words suffering and sacrifice how many of you like these words suffering and sacrifice okay <laughs> okay fine suffering and sacrifice we don't like it most of the time but the truth is that if you want to live god's plan and purpose for your life if you want to fulfill god's plan and purpose for your life if you want to do everything that god wants you to do in your life that he has planned there is a time for suffering and there is also a time for sacrifice a life for god is not devoid of these things so suffering and sacrifice even jesus says that you know you will face many trials tribulations and persecutions okay so it's not devoid our life is not devoid of these things um and we know that when we go about fulfilling god's purpose for our lives it will cost us something okay Jesus said in Luke chapter 14, verse 27. Can somebody read that, please? Luke 14, 27. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. Yes. So Jesus is saying, if you're going to be my disciple, there is one thing that's going to be part of your life. And what is that one thing? The cross. The cross is something that is going to be part of your life. Okay. And you have to carry your cross when? Daily. Okay. It's not like a weekly or monthly or a season thing. It's daily. Okay. So every day your life as a disciple involves carrying the cross. Okay. Now the cross, when you look at the cross, it, uh, it denotes three things. What are the three things when we look at the cross? What does it denote? Suffering. Separation salvation sacrifice okay so it involves suffering separation and sacrifice and when we look at the cross we know how much jesus suffered for us okay just imagining how somebody can be hanged with nails you know and their and their hands and their legs can be so traumatizing and we so 
painful can you know we cannot even think about the cruciating pain that somebody can go to so it was not easy for jesus it was a place of suffering cross is also a place of separation why do we say it's a place of separation why is the cross the place of separation huh death okay separated from sins Jesus took on the sins of the whole world. He was sinless, but he took on the sins of the whole world. Okay, when I'm talking about Jesus, why was for Jesus, uh, we'll come to, sorry? He was separated from the Father, right? You know, he was separated from the Father, okay? And also the cross is a place of separation for us. How is it a place of separation for us? Look at what Paul says in Galatians Chapter 6, verse 14. Can somebody read that, please? Yeah, thank you, Sh uh, Shani. Jesus was separated from the Father on the cross. Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. It's on page number 43 in the publication. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. So how does the cross separate us from the world? From this verse, how does the cross separate us from the world? Crucifixion of Jesus. Crucifixion of Jesus. How does the cross separate us from this world? Are we in the world? Yes, we are in this world. Yes, but how does the world, how are we crucified to the world? Okay. Lord Jesus Christ. Okay. You have to die daily. Okay. It means here that the world does not attract us anymore. Mm -hmm. The things of the world does not attract us. The things of the world does not please us anymore. The cross is also a place of sacrifice. Okay. Is that mic off? Yes. Okay. Uh, the cross is also a place of sacrifice. What does sacrifice mean? What does sacrifice mean? Okay, giving up something that you have a right to, okay, and taking up something that you don't have to, okay? Sacrifice involves two things. Sacrifice involves giving up something that you have a right to, okay? Uh, and it also involves taking up something that you don't have to, okay? I'll give you an example, okay? Okay. Um, if you look at uh, uh, Paul's life, okay, uh, in um, in First Corinthians chapter, uh, nine verses one to four, I think. No, sorry. Um, Okay, I don't know where it is, but, you know, um, Paul says that, you know, he has a right to uh, marry a believing wife, okay? Um, he says that as an apostle, I have a right to, um, you know, um, marry a believing wife, okay? Note what he says, believing wife. So he has a right to it. But what does he do? He gives up his right makes a sacrifice for the sake of the gospel so that he can go travel around minister he gives up his right to marry a believing wife and stays a bachelor for the rest of his life and also he says that you know he has a right as an apostle as a preacher as a teacher to live on the contributions that people are giving to him to that he's ministering to but he says he gives up the, that right to take on those contributions. And what does he do instead? Instead, he works. You know, Paul was a tent maker. Okay. So he was a businessman. He was a tent maker. He used to do tent making business, earn money. And that way he used to uh, support himself and support his team. And he did not want to become a burden to anyone else. So that is also a sacrifice. He had this right to take the 
offerings to live off the people that he is ministering to. He had a right to do that, but he did not use that right. He worked, he did his business, he, you know, he took care of his needs and also the needs of his team. So he gave up the right. Okay. Also, he had to had a right to marry a believing wife, but he did not use that right. Now you're able to understand? Yes. So it is, uh, you know, it is giving up something like he gave up the right to have a believing wife and taking on something that you don't have to. He did not have to do business. He could have just lived off people's money, the contributions that he received, but he did not do that. Also look at what Paul says in Philippians chapter 3, verse 7. Can somebody read that, please? Uh, can you pass him the mic, please? But what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. He says, what things have been gained to me, I counted loss for Christ. That means he's saying, hey, I was a fad, I'm a Pharisee, the tribe of the ben of Benjamin. I've uh, trained under, you know, great big uh, scholars like Gamaliel. I've studied the Old Testament. We, we saw that, you know, um, uh, uh, Paul for 33 years, you know, he was persecuting the Christians. He was a learned man. He knew everything of the Old Testament uh, laws. But he says, I gain, oh, I, I leave all that and I count that as loss, you know, uh, considering who I am in Christ. Yes, Vinay? Uh, the verse which we are referring to was 1 Corinthians 9.5, Pastor. 1 Corinthians 9.5. Okay, yeah. thank you. Can you read that, please? Uh, 1 Corinthians 9.5. Do we have no right to eat and drink? Do we have no right to take along a believing wife? As do also the other apostles, the brothers of the Lord and Cephas. Or is it only... Yes, thank you. So he's here, he says, we have the right, but we give it up. Okay, so that is also a sacrifice. Look at what Jesus said in John chapter 12, verses 24 to 26. Yes, Shani? I don't, I was trying to, I wanted to, first I was going to ask this question, and I was going to see what else you're talking about, but I don't understand when you were saying carry your cross daily. What do you mean by okay, that? Okay, you see what it means to carry our cross. We just we are coming to that. We are looking at that, and then uh, if you still do not understand, then maybe I'll explain again. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, let's look at uh, John chapter twelve, verses twenty-four to twenty-six. Please, can somebody read that? Most assuredly, I say to you, unless a grain of of wheat fall into the ground and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it produces much grain. He who, he who loves his life will lose it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, let him follow me, and where I am, there my servants will be also. If anyone serves me, him my father will honor. Okay. So here, what is Jesus saying? Saying that, you know, if we live a self-centered life, like a grain that says, hey, I don't want to fall on the ground. I don't want to die. I want to just be contained in myself. Can that grain produce fruit? No. Okay. To produce fruit, what does that grain have to do? Fall on the ground, die. And so Jesus said that what happens when you carry your cross or when you die to things of this world carrying the cross means you dying to the things of this world no i meant can you please put on the tube lights so that we can have some more brightness because it's very dark and dungy here thank you so he's saying jesus is saying that you know when we die to the things of the world carrying the cross means we die to the things of this world Okay, so when you die to the things of this world, what are you doing? The only then can you bear much fruit. Okay, so the pathway to fruitfulness is always death. The pathway to fruitfulness is always death. So the seed falls to the ground and dies, only then can it bear fruit, right? So if you want to bear fruit in your life, you have to die to the worldly sinful passions and 
desires. You have to die to the worldly ways and patterns of this world that is not godly, that is immoral. Okay? So every time you die, you're preparing yourself for resurrection. Amen? Every time you die, you're preparing yourself for resurrection. We all want the resurrection power, but we don't want death. Right? We all want the resurrection power of God to be manifested in our lives, but we don't want to die to certain things, the certain habits, certain lifestyles, certain attitudes, certain set patterns. Okay? So if you want resurrection power, you have to die. Okay? So Jesus says, if you will die to self, you will bear much fruit. So bearing the cross means dying to the things of your self, sinful desires, passions, lustful passions, things of this world that are not things of the spirit. Okay. Now, when we talk about sacrifice, there are two kinds of sacrifice, daily sacrifice and life sacrifice. What is daily sacrifice? Daily sacrifices are meaning that we daily carry our cross means daily we need to make sacrifices. So what are the daily sacrifices which shows that we carry the cross? Overcoming temptation, you're tempted to hit back at somebody, talk back at somebody, show your anger, retaliate, show your nasty attitude, uh, you know, fight back, uh, you know. Uh, oh, that person did this to me? Okay, I'll teach them a lesson. I won't do this. I won't do that. You know, or gossip, backbite, backstabbing, whatever it is. All of these things. What are some of the other daily sacrifices? Sorry? Okay, saying no to the things of this world and saying yes to the things of God. Yes. Your attitudes, your lifestyles, your mindset. What else? What are the daily Okay, being humble. Okay. What else? Daily sacrifices? Sacrificing sleep for praying. Yes. Sacrificing entertainment for reading your Bible and praying. Sacrificing just talking, watching YouTube things, videos, you know, movies. Sacrificing for just reading your Bible or reading a book that can edify your spirit. Man, daily sacrifices. Daily sacrifices can also be, you know, loving your spouse who's being irritating, loving your children who's who are not, not being obedient, who being difficult, loving people in your life, forgiving them, being caring, being compassionate, being gracious, being merciful, all of those attributes. That is daily sacrifices. And that is when we daily, you know, are carrying our cross. Okay. Now, if... Um, uh, our daily sacrifices can be very small, but can be very crucial in advancing our calling because our daily sacrifices is what is building up our character, is what is setting us up to make that, you know, life sacrifices. If we, if we can't make daily sacrifices, we cannot make life sacrifices that God calls us to make, like going to be a missionary in a difficult place or, you know, being a pastor or starting a business, which can be very difficult for years. You have to invest, you have to keep at it. You have to be faithful, sincere, you know, uh, studying, uh, getting into a job or studying something that you want to. Uh, God has called you to be a missionary doctor. You've spent so many years of hard work in studying medicine. And then God says, be a missionary doctor, sends you to Jharkhand or sends you to Orissa, some remote villages and you're just willing to go, right? That is making life sacrifices. And those life sacrifices, you know, depends on the small sacrifices that we are making daily, right? And so Paul also compares our Christian life to the life of an athlete, okay? In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Can somebody read that, please? 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. Do, do, you, do you not know that, that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize, run, run in such a way that you may obtain it? And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. No, they do it to, now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore, I run thus, not with uncertainty, 
Thus I fight not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should become disqualified. Amen. Thank you, Juliana. So here Paul is saying that, you know, in an earthly race, when people run, okay, what happens? Who wins the prize? Only one, right? But in the race that we are running in life, the spiritual race, how many of us get the prize, the reward? All who finish the race, right? All who finish the race. And then he says, he compares our race that we run to an athlete. He says, an athlete are temperate in all things. And why are they temperate in all things? So that they can win a prize that is perishable. But we are running a race that is receiving a prize that is imperishable. Now, if you look at athletes, especially if you look at, you know, um, I, I just, I like swimming and gymnastics. So I've been following up on the world's uh, best uh, swimmer, um, you know, um, just looking at his lifestyle. He says all he's been doing is, you know, he's just been hours of practice, eight, nine hours of practice, just theory, practice, theory, practice. His life has been just that. And he's won so many um, medals in the Olympics. If you look at the gymnasts, you know, they're young as, you know, uh, five, six, seven, eight years. They go into training. Sometimes they, especially when I was following up some Chinese gymnasts, just uh, looking at a documentary, you know, they leave their home. They go to another place. Young children, age of six, seven, you know, they're training so many hours a day, you know, having a specific kind of diet. They can't eat ice creams and chocolates and everything that they like to. They have a specific diet. They train for six, seven hours a day. Uh, even Michael Phelps, who's one of the world's best um, uh, swimmers, you know, uh, says, you know, the food that he has to eat, the hours of training that he has to go through. And he, one point of time he came to life, he says, hey, this is really, you know, really boring, you know, discipline life. It's let me just kind of enjoy life for some time. And he just went astray. And then he comes back and he apologizes for going astray and living a life that was not a model to the youngsters who are looking up to uh, him. Okay. But we see that the strenuous and the, you know, discipline and the, the vigorous training that they have to go through all because to receive one gold medal, in one Olympics that comes four years or, you know, the world um, tournament that happens maybe I think every year or something like that, just to receive that. And so how much more when we are running the race of life, how much more we need to be disciplined, how much more we need to focus on things and our calling and what God has asked us to do. Okay. And also the second thing is, you know, life sacrifices, you know, sometimes Life sacrifices can alter our life. God can ask us to leave us specific jobs, take on other jobs, you know, leave our city, go to another city. And we know of examples like Abraham and Moses, you know, who left their home, their family, the geography, geographical area that they were accustomed to go to a new place. And that became their inheritance. Moses, you know, God called him. He felt he was incapable, but he took on that leadership responsibility and he never gave up till the end. And if you look at the great life examples of Hudson Taylor, who went to China, William Carey, who came here to India, you know, his he lost so many of his children to malaria. They died. His wife became mad. The printing press that he was printing Bibles, I think he printed Bibles in six languages, um, Hindi, Assami, Oriya. Uh, Bengali, uh, Arabic, you know, uh, printed all of these languages, his printing press, all his years of hard work, you know, everything got burnt, but he started all over again. He never gave up. Okay. So these are life sacrifices that people made so many more. And when you walk around this whole building of the Bible college, you see all around great men and women of God, their posters, their wall hangings, their sayings, you know, all who have done great things. And it was nothing less than a big life sacrifice that they had made. Okay. Also, we need to understand that sacrifices can be fleshly sacrifices and spirit led. Okay. Sometimes, 
you know, we see our friend or somebody else in our church, they left their job and went into full-time ministry. So you hear a message on missions or evangelism or the call of God, you're excited, you leave your job and you go into full-time ministry and you're not bearing fruit and you're saying, God, what are you doing? I was better off in my job. And God is saying, hey, did I ask you to leave your job and come into full-time? ministry you were better off in your job in your job you were at least ministering to so many people you were fruitful i was using you but i didn't ask you to leave your job and come into full-time ministry so sometimes people you know say i you know i left my job i had a big job i was earning so much i left my full-time job and came into full-time ministry and if you ask them hey what what i what are some of the things you do you know, when I was my job, I had to wake up at six o'clock, you know, I had to leave home by seven o'clock and I come back late by eight. And sometimes there is calls. Sometimes I didn't don't finish. So I'm working right up to 11, 12 in the night. But here in ministry, I get up at 10 o'clock. Anyway, I'm a pastor, right? 10 o'clock. People are only free after 11, 11, 30. Easy. Just go and visit. You know, when I visit, they give me nice food to eat. See how much I weight. Look at my uh, tummy. You know, I put on nice weight and all of those things. So that is fleshly led sacrifice. It's not a God, call of God on your life. So you need to know whether it is God calling you or it is your own fleshly desire. How do you know whether it's the call of God or your fleshly led sacrifice? What is the one thing? How do you know if your sacrifice is spirit led or flesh led? Huh? You look at your fruits. If there is no fruit, you know this is not spirit-led, right? If it's spirit-led, you will be bearing fruit. It will profit not only you, it will profit other people. Other people's lives will be transformed. People will come into the kingdom. Your business will grow. Your uh, job will grow. Your job expertise will grow. You will be like uh, Joseph and Daniel in the workplace where people are looking at your excellence and they are just praising the God who's given you the wisdom. Okay. So we must understand what kind of sacrifices that we are making. Is God called you to do it? Or you are just making that sacrifice. And how do you know it? By the fruit. Okay. We'll come back and look at the second test and then we'll move on to uh, the last chapter.